We're going to continue our Everyday Miracle series that we've been in for the past few weeks. Has anybody been enjoying this series so far? Uh, like we've said, thank you, all right. Like we've said the past few weeks, the, this series is um, it's called Everyday Miracle, and it is about the reality that you are already living in as a follower of Jesus, the, rea- the miraculous, supernatural reality that, that already defines your existence as a child of God. Now, there are miracles that, that are uh, available to us if we will exercise our faith, if we will take a step, if we will reach out, if we will call on God, if we'll knock on the door of heaven. And even some of that stuff is stuff that, that we'll get pressed into in midweek and in our worship night tonight. Like there, there's, there's that stuff, right, that God is going, will you believe in me for greater things, for more things? And we want to live that sort of miraculous life. In this series, though, we're taking some time to just come awake again to the miracles that are already in our lives the miraculous nature that, that defines the reality we're living in already, that God is love, that you are safe and secure in the Father. That, like, the, these are the things that we've been talking about the past few weeks. The first week was just the miraculous fact that you exist. The odds of existing are so low, y'all, so low that you actually even made it here, that you made it to this thing called life that we're all participants in. It's a miracle in and of itself that you're here, right? Um, and so we're going to continue in this conversation today. Uh, I did express last week that my hope for the, this series and for each of these sermons for our time together on Sundays is that more than anything, that you would have a moment in your body, in your soul, whether you're in this room with us right now or you're watching online or you'll listen to this later on our podcast, that you could have a moment of landing back in your life, a moment of grounding, a moment where the breath comes back into your lungs. If you've been stressed out, if you've been just making it from one thing to the next, if you've just been, I don't know if you find yourself, sometimes I realize like, I think I've just been reacting to stimuli for the past four hours. Anybody ever have those moments? Am I intentionally in my life right now or am I just reacting to one thing after the other? That you would have a moment here of just feeling the breath re-enter your lungs and to realize again how good God is, how much he loves you, how present he is in your life, how much of a gift this life is, and that you, that we together could once again get in touch with God and get in touch with our souls. And so before we even get into the sermon today, I actually just want to give us a moment. Let's take a moment to be completely silent. Can we do that? Completely still, completely silent. And just, you can close your eyes, you can keep your eyes open. Let's just sit here because I bet you haven't had a moment like this in a while. Hours, days, weeks, I don't know. Let's just be here and remember and realize again that you are alive, that God loves you, that God is with you, and this whole thing is a gift. Can we do that? Moment of silence beginning right now. Let's read Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11. It'll be on the screen. You can turn there in your Bible as well. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, 
a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. This is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. This is an iconic passage. You can go back to that first, um, the first slide. of There we go. It's an iconic passage. There have been songs in pop culture around it. The language is familiar to us. Um, what, what I'm not going to do as we talk about this passage uh, is get into a whole, um, a, a whole sermon about understanding uh, violence and nonviolence in the Old Testament and the way of Jesus and all of that. Yes, there, don't be thrown by some of the language in this, a time to kill or a time to hate. Uh, that stuff might be like, whoa, what am I supposed to do with that? Not really going there today. What I want, the point I want us to get out of this is the point that I think the author is making is that it's a, he's, he's drawing a picture of these various extremes, right? And that there is a time for everything is the, what he's saying. There's a time for everything in a season for every activity under the heavens. And so what I, what I want us to talk about today is this idea of seasons. Seasons. Life is broken up into seasons. Maybe broken up is even the wrong language to use. Life flows from one season to the next. Your life, you were created and you were designed to live like a plant that grows from one season to the next. In fact, God created the world and created life and created the cycles of life, and seasons are such a defining part of it. And so for many of us, we find ourselves stuck and frustrated, and Caroline was touching on this in in that ministry moment. If you feel frustrated in your life right now, so often we can live without an awareness of seasons, the seasonal nature that is meant to define our lives. And so this everyday miracle that you are a living being, living in a living world, and there is life all around you. My wife Kirby and I, we had a moment recently, we were driving down the road, and she, and, and you know, we're, we're, Atlanta's a unique city. One of the nicknames for Atlanta is the city among the trees, I believe is the phrase. Anybody familiar with this? Yeah. And so we're driving somewhere in town and there's all these buildings, right? But then there was also all this greenery like everywhere. It was like this combination of concrete and glass and steel and leaves everywhere. And, uh, and we were just like, man, life is everywhere. And you can, you can almost not see it unless you really see it. Like I could, I could drive through town and not even notice but when I started to look around, it was kind of crazy the amount of trees and bushes and flowers and leaves that were just exploding out of every place that there was an opportunity for them to in the midst of all um, that was built up around the city. Um, but God created us as organic living things in an organic world. And sometimes we can, we can lose sight of that. Um, and the thing about seasons is that they change, and sometimes we can lose sight of that, and we can feel stuck in a certain place in life, and we can begin to experience our lives or view where our station in life in the moment as if it is fixed and eternal and not realize that things change, seasons change, and we are currently in one season, and one day we will be in a different one. You with me? Yeah? Is this good? I think it's good stuff. All right. Um, so the, the word season that's used in this passage is a Hebrew word, zimon, uh, and it just means an appointed occasion, right? So it's like this is, this is the time of year for this. When you think about harvest times, when you think about I mean, just the four seasons of, of our year, right? Summer, autumn, winter, and spring, and each has its own defining thing. And certain things happen in certain seasons, um, and certain things don't 
happen in different seasons. It's, it is such a critical and crucial skill for us, for you as a follower of Jesus, and this is just a, as a human, to learn how to discern your season, to discern what season you are in in your life. What is it time for in your life right now? What is it time for? What defines the season that you're in? If you want to zoom out, it, maybe it's helpful to, to start, if you're, if you're beginning a process of wanting to discern that, maybe it help, it's helpful to, to zoom out a little bit and think about life stages. I don't want us to think that every life stage is, is a season, and because we actually all experience, you know, 10 people could be in the same life stage and ex- be experiencing it very differently based on the different things that define that time of their life. But maybe, maybe start off by, by what life stage are you in? Are you a college student? That is a life stage. There's a lot that comes. We're, we're some college students in the house. All right, yeah, yeah. I was like, there's some college students right there. Hey, like college is a, li- is a life stage, right? It's a very, there's some stuff that defines college. It's different from when you were in high school. It's different from when you get out of college. Um, Young professional, yo pro, as, as we call them around here. Any yo pros in the house? Come over, let's see you guys, right? Anybody? Okay, there's more of y'all. You're just like, I don't want to raise my hand. So, but there's this, there's a stage, there's a life stage, a lot that comes with that, regardless of what your career is or whatever. There's a, there's a, there's a whole life stage. Any newlyweds or young, let's say young married couples without kids, young married without kids. How, where are y'all at? Life stage, that's a fun one, y'all. Let me tell you, because you can go out to dinner at 9 o'clock on a Tuesday if you want to. Like, what do we want to do? You know, we could keep watching Netflix or like, let's get dressed up and go to 246 or something. Like, you can do whatever you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. This is a man who just had his third kid. You can do whatever you want to do. How about uh, about families with young kids? Where are y'all at? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, finally, someone sees me. Someone see. I've been families with older kids. I stepped in on a on a conversation Justin was having with some dads up here, and he was telling a story. He was talking about his kids being like not young kids anymore, and the liberty that comes with that. So, so families with kids that aren't specifically young kids, maybe like elementary and up kids. Any anybody there? Oh, your kids are all that age or older. A few of y'all, it's great. Y'all, they're out doing stuff because they can. All the people with young kids are like, someone else take this kid for a few hours while I'm in here. Um, empty nesters. Any empty nesters in the room? Yeah, come on. There's, um, and, and I'm, I'm missing some stages. There we go. There we go. I know I'm missing some stages as well. And you could name like retirement or whatever. Like there's all sorts of different, um, think of it in terms of like the fixtures in your life that sort of define where you're, you're living within the confines of these fixtures in your life. Now, there's also, you can't, you can't reduce it all the way down because there's all sorts of things that are personal to you that are also happening in your life that are defining how you experience that life stage. And there is no specific length of time that those life stages necessarily last. Obviously, kids are born and then grow to a certain age and all of that. But you could have a season. And what I didn't say is, is single. So YoPro could also, like, it, you might be a single person, a young person. You might be a person who's single, who's in a prolonged stage of singleness, where a lot of your peers are getting married, or a lot of your peers are having kids. And so now that life stage, as it extends, starts to come with some discouragement, maybe, or disappointment, or pain. You with me? So, so sometimes the, these lines are different for different people and how we experience them. You might be entering into a new life stage before you were ready to. Maybe you got married, and then the first kid came pretty quick, and those date nights aren't what they were, you know, and, you, and, and so you're going, okay, we're adjusting. We're adjusting here. You fill in the blank, right? You know where you're at in your life. But so there are these life stages. I think that's helpful to, to zoom out and go, okay, where am I at? And what stage am I at in my life? And then to begin to ask the question, what season, how would, I de- how would I define my season, the season that I'm in right now? Um, and that may be a season that is defined by a lot of fun and a lot of joy and a lot of things going your way. It might be a season that's defined by a lot of heartbreak and pain. More often than not, 
a season comes with joy and fun and excitement and new things, and then also pain and discouragement or frustration for things that are related or unrelated. And so we have to learn how to hold all of that, right? And not just paint our interpretation of our life with a broad brush and say, it's all this and we miss what's over here. This is the skill of discernment. The skill of reflection is so important as we, uh, as we, as followers of Jesus, want to grow in our ability to relate to our own life well. And part of the reason this is so important is so often I've found through the years that if I ask someone to tell me about their relationship with God right now, so often without realizing they start talking to me about their season. And why is that? It's because we don't even, we don't realize how much, how we're experiencing our life defines how we're relating to God, just that subconsciously or accidentally, it can just happen, right? Tell me about your relationship with God. Oh, you know, work's been really stressful right now. We just kind of start going into our life and sometimes don't even, we, we accidentally don't even see how God is at work in those places. Or sometimes we're just tapped out and we're at capacity and, and find that, man, I, I haven't been intentionally connecting with God beyond just asking for his help in the stuff in my life that's hard, <laughs> right? Would anybody confess to that? <laughs> Found yourself there? Well, I'll, I'll confess. I'm a pastor. I'll confess to that one, right? Sometimes I'll look up and go, oh man, I haven't just enjoyed God in the presence of God recently. I've just been going, hey God, I need your help here. I need your help here. I need your help here. And that's not to shame you or myself. It's to go, oh wow, okay, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity to lean in a little bit more. What season are you in? What life stage are you in? Let's do this. Let's take a break. Let's take a minute. And I want you to answer this question to yourself, by yourself. What life stage, how, what, how would you define what life stage you're in? You can use whatever language you want. How would you define what life stage you're in? And how would you describe what season of life you're in? And to, to be able to, do you guys feel like you have enough information from me so far to, to kind of name the difference between those two? Season being, how are you experiencing your life? What's maybe the headline over that right now? Life stage is just what life stage are you in? You, you know, married with young kids or whatever. Take, take a second, name that for yourself. And now I'm going to ask you to turn to a neighbor and tell them what you just thought to yourself, if you're willing to. Will you do that? We're in the middle of a sermon, but will you do that? Will you just like lean over to somebody next to you and be like, yeah, hey, I'm, this is my name. This is my life stage. And this is sort of how I'm seeing my season right now. You, can, you don't have to be more vulnerable than you want to be, but just say something. Go. If you're with us online, do this as well. Or if you're by yourself, write it down. Let's do a few more seconds. I'm hearing a bit of a lull. A few more seconds. If you're the only one who's talked in this interaction, you should stop talking. I want to read another passage to you. This is Psalm 16. It'll be on the screen as well. You can turn there too. Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. 
I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out their libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone. So this is David talking about all the different ways that he could go in his life and when he looks around the world around him. Lord, you alone, though, are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. This is a really important verse for us. The boundary lines have fallen from me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. There's another slide. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body, my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. There's a lot here. I love this psalm. I've loved it for years. Let's go back to the first, um, the first slide, but this first verse is great. Um, so, you know, he's talking about all, you know, he could orient himself in the world, the way that the people around him are and running after other gods and the things he's naming here. But he says, no, you alone are my portion and my cup. Then he says this really important statement. He says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. This idea of the boundary lines of your life, where are the boundary lines falling in your life? This is so important practically for how we relate to our lives and how we relate to God via our lives. Because it, so often we, we, um, we can interpret God's nature or at least God's orientation toward us based on the circumstances of our lives. We can do it without realizing it, right? And so David says, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Now, this is a passage and a verse that years ago when I looked at this, I struggled to say, yeah, yeah, I agree with that statement, that I could say it authentically with my own lips. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I found myself 10 years ago or more, I'll be, I'll be 40 in January. I know, hard to believe, right? But here we go. I'll be 40 in January, 39 right now. And for me personally, I'll just share a little bit about my, my relationship with seasons of life. And when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I had a lot of, um, of frustration with my life stage and a lot of frustration with my season. Um, and there was a lot of tension and even inner conflict and, and the way I was even relating to God, I, was having, I had conflict in my relationship with God because I was trying to figure out what to do and how to relate to some of the details of my life. And so a verse like this where David is saying, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, I found myself going, I don't know if I feel that. Like the, I'm aware of the boundary lines of my life right now. I'm aware of where I'm at vocationally. I'm aware of where I'm at um, relationally in the world. I'm aware of where I'm at um, in, uh, in my current life stage. And I'll, talk, I'll share in a, in a moment a little bit about some of the, the way my wife and I, we've experienced um, moving from one life stage to another. But there was a period of, of, of some prolonged frustration, some prolonged disappointment that, um, that creates a, a challenge in your life and in your faith that you have to figure out how to relate to it. What I couldn't see at the time was that boundary lines are not permanent. Now, some of them are. Before you say that's good, it is good. It is good. Um, the, the, some, some boundary lines are like, like you are who you are, right? You can, you, now, you are, you're, God created you to grow and change and mature and all that kind of stuff. But some, something at a fundamental level whatever makes you you, like that's you, right? And that's not going anywhere. And I, I, I think that's a boundary line. And that's something that if we can accept it and embrace it, it's a really beautiful thing, right? Um, and there are th details of your life that you can't change. You can't change the family you were born into. Now you can change how you relate to that family of origin. You can change how you, the, the people that are in you know, the relationships you have moving forward, all that kind of stuff. But you can't change your, your origins, your history. You, you were born at a time in history that you were born in, we all were. You were born where you were born. Um, all that stuff, like the, some of those create the, some fixed points in your life that you'll carry with you all of your life. 
right? So there's some of those boundary lines. But in general, the boundary lines of your life shift with different life stages and with different seasons. And I, co- I honestly couldn't see it in, a, in, a, in a, my kind of more frustrating season of life. I could not, I didn't have the imagination. Um, I think the frustration was, was eclipsing my imagination for what could and actually most likely would change. Like sometimes it's a faith thing. Do I have the faith to see the thing change in my life? Sometimes it's like, do I have, can I just embrace a little common sense and go, this isn't going to stay like this forever. Like just at a human level, things change. This is going to change. I'm not always going to be in this state. Like the, I'm going to move to the next place and there's going to be some stuff that comes with it if I can just kind of get out of my little prairie dog hole for a minute and look around, you know? And so I got, I was stuck in a prairie dog hole for a season and, and feeling some frustration and could not see um, that, yeah, I had particular boundary lines in my life at that moment. And if I could just embrace those for the time that they were there, I think a lot of suffering would have not been present in my life, right? If I could just embrace what was while it was there and be there and let it be, and then take the necessary steps on into the future at the right moment, like that would be a, uh, if I have any regret, I kind of wish I had just chilled out a little bit around a few things, like honestly, you know? Um, I don't know, maybe this is like a really good word for somebody in the room right now because you're finding yourself frustrated with the boundary lines of your life. And let's just lean into this language here for a minute. I'm not trying to be dogmatic about the language in the scriptures and these verses, but I think this could be really helpful. There's a difference between boundary lines and inheritance, right? So let's go here. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Then he says, surely I have a delightful inheritance. Let me tell you this. Your current boundary lines are not your inheritance. You have a different thing in your future than what you're just experiencing right now. Come on, this is good. This is good. I know we got some energy on this side of the room over here. All right, so, so your experience, and, and this is where we get mixed up because we don't, so, so often we can, we can get so focused on what's happening right now that we can't see or believe or imagine that there's something bigger and better and different down the road. And so this is a moment, yes, of faith, but also of like, like really just a little bit of common sense to go, things don't stay the same. Life moves forward. The river keeps flowing. The plant keeps growing. Come on. I'm, I'm just riffing right now. That was a good one. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And he says, surely I have a delightful inheritance. I can hold the tension. It's as if he's saying, I can hold the tension between what is and what will be. I can hold it all. And I'm willing to trust you as I walk forward in it. But then the verse before it, I love this. But he says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. So there's an acknowledgement that regardless of the circumstances of my life, whether I'm experiencing them as good or bad, whether I would interpret them as good or bad, because it's kind of hard to know actually in the moment, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Like we, we jump to conclusions to interpret the events of our lives, not realizing, oh, maybe that thing was beneficial to me but I only experienced it as if it was like the devil attacking me. Not everything's the devil, all right? So like some things are just things. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. But he says, you alone are my portion and my cup. And I love this because you kind of get the perspective of someone who's lived a little bit of life, who's able to say that was hard or that was painful or that was whatever that was. And this ended up being really great down the road But actually, all the while, the best thing was just you, God. Just you. You've been there with me in all of it. You are my portion. It's not about the circumstances you provide for me. It's not about the battles you win for me. It's not about the the pit that you pulled me out of. Or the mountain you placed me on top of, to use some of that psalm language, right? But about you, you've been there. You've been there with me this whole time. I think there's just something so beautiful if we can, sometimes we can get so fixated on the circumstances of our lives, so fixated on the details of our lives. And that is not to, to, um, to minimize 
the very real pain points of our life. I want to acknowledge those. God meets us in those places. God cares about that stuff. He really cares about it. Sometimes, though, we can get so fixated on, on the pain and the joy and the good and the bad and the, the disappointment and the fulfillment and all of that, that we can actually miss the one who is, who is our portion in our cup, the one who is the source, the one who it's all about him and this connection, this relationship, this intimate friendship that he's invited us into, um, regardless of where we find ourselves. And so the part of the everyday miracle of seasons is regardless of your season that you find yourself in right now, however you would name your life stage, however you would name your season, however you're experiencing this time in your life, regardless of if it's, if it's a time that feels like it's a time of flourishing or if it feels like it's a time of death, God is here with you in it, providing for you. He is your portion in your cup. This is good news. This is good news. Um, yeah, what are the boundary lines of your life right now? I won't make you talk to somebody again, don't worry, but this is just for you. What are the boundary lines? Some of y'all are like, thank God, I can just take a breath. I know that it, there's nothing else coming where he's going to make me. What are the boundary lines of your life right now? I have very specific boundary lines in my life right now. Oh, I told you, I promised you guys I would talk a little bit about my wife and I's experience of our seasons. So if you've been around, you know this. It took us a long time to start a family. It took us a long time to get pregnant. We tried for a while, seven years of trying to start a family. Finally got pregnant, had our first kid in 2019. We did IVF um, to get there, and we had many years of other fertility treatments and all that kind of stuff. A lot of pain, a lot of frustration, a lot of disappointment. All of our friends were having like their third kid, and we, weren't ha- we didn't have any, you know? And so, yeah, we could go out to dinner and do the fun couples without kids stuff, but we would have rather been home with a crying baby, you know, by that point. You know what I'm saying? And so there was a, and all the while, we're serving God and trying to do, you know, bless people and whatever, and, and going, what are we, what's going on? What are we missing here? You know, and there's a, it's a hard Um, the the scriptures say hope deferred makes the heart sick. And there was a sickness that we experienced at heart as we just had a prolonged, disappointing time period. Um, and so that was, that was difficult. It was a real difficult thing. We find ourselves now in a season where we just had our third kid, um, which is amazing, right? And so come on. Yeah, we can applaud that. It's great. And, and so for so long, I found myself relating to my season, longing for the next one to begin just longing for that next season to start. And right now, I mean, I, I, if I'm honest, I'm in a season where I'm going, how do, I, how do we press pause? How do we hold on to this? And the same tension is, is applied in reverse where it's like, these kids are going to keep growing and they're going to move out. And, they're gonna, and that's going to be great. There's going to be amazing things that come with that too, but I'm going, I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss. They want to snuggle with me. They want me to hold them. They want daddy to throw them in the air. Now, if you weren't here last week, I had, I had my appendix removed two weeks ago. A lot going on in our life right now. Uh, that was unexpected. So I can't throw my kids in the air for another couple of weeks. They ask me every day, daddy, are your boo-boos? You still have your boo-boos or not? Um, and so the uh, doctor's orders, I, I am breaking his rules some because I just got to like pick up a screaming three-year-old and drag her to the car sometimes. But, um, but so there's a lot defining our season right now. Uh, but but I've, I find myself going, oh my gosh, like it's so sweet. How do we hang? How do we hang on? How do I not miss it at least? Because there's hard stuff, you know. I could easily go, okay, in about six months the baby will be sleeping better, and our second daughter will be, will definitely be potty trained, and like I can start to go. It'll be a little bit easier then. Then I have to stop myself and go, no, 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 no. Don't wish it away. Don't wish this moment away. I felt like God actually said that to me when, when our first child was born. And I was looking at her. It's like the first week she was home with us. I'm looking at her and I'm going, oh my gosh, what's it going to be like when she can talk and when we can play? And I immediately felt, don't wish it away. Don't wish that you're right here. You're right here. Don't skip this part. And so I, it's kind of become a mantra in our family. Like, don't wish it away. Just be right here because you will not get this back. You can't get it back. And I think that applies to, that's helpful advice actually for every season of life, whether you're looking at the sweetness of young kids or being a college student, being a young professional, being married without kids, being single. Like, there is sweetness in every season. 
And if all you see is what you want to change about your life, you will lose eventually the sweetness of this season and you can't get it back. It's not coming back. And then it, it, we could fall into this rut of only relating to the challenging parts of our lives and only seeing the frustrating parts of our lives, and we just skip from one season to the next wishing things were different constantly. So can I, can, how, how do I savor the sweetness that is present in my life right now and hold the tension of all of that? And there's a tension to be held. And once again, if you are in a season of prolonged frustration or prolonged disappointment, oh my gosh, my heart goes out to you in whatever season you're in, because um, it, these words can feel really trite if you're in that place. Someone talking into a microphone saying, just enjoy the sweetness. I know in this room there's pain. Some of y'all are in pain around the prolonged season you've been in, and I want to hold space for that. Um, it's really, really important to be able to acknowledge that in a general sense, though. How do we just not miss it, not miss the thing that's right there in front of us? I have one more um, verse I want to read to us, then we're going to be done. Or It's not a verse, it's a, a, qu a quote uh, from Parker Palmer's book, Let Your Life Speak. This is, uh, this is a good one. He says, the notion that our lives are like the eternal cycle of the seasons does not deny the struggle or the joy, the loss or the gain, the darkness or the light, but encourages us to embrace it all and to find in all of it the opportunities for growth. If we lived close to nature in an agricultural society, the seasons as a metaphor, in fact, would continually frame our lives. But the master metaphor of our era does not come from agriculture. It comes from manufacturing. We do not believe that we grow our lives. We believe that we make them. Just listen to how we use the word in everyday speech. We make time, make friends, make meaning, make money, make a living, make love. I once heard Alan Watts observe that a Chinese child would, will ask, how does a baby grow? But an American child will ask, how do you make a baby? From an early age, we absorb our culture's arrogant conviction that we manufacture everything, reducing the world to mere raw material that lacks all value until we impose our designs and labor on it. If we accept the notion that our lives are dependent on an inexorable cycle of seasons, on a play of powers that we can conspire with but never control, I think that's important, that's insightful, there's a play of powers at work in, in our lives that we can conspire with, we can work with it, but we can't control it. We run headlong into a culture that insists against all evidence that we can make whatever kind of life we want whenever we want it. Deeper still, we run headlong into our own egos, which want desperately to believe that we are always in charge. We need to challenge and reform these distortions of culture and ego, reform them toward ways of thinking and doing and being that are rooted in respect for the living ecology of life. Unlike raw material on which we make all demands, this ecology makes demands on us, even as it sustains our lives. We are here not only to tr transform the world, but also to be transformed. I love the way Parker Palmer talks about that. I relate to it so much because I am not, my experience of life is not defined by agriculture. It's defined by my experience of in the modern world, manufacturing, and even since this book was written like Amazon Prime or whatever, like just get what you want when you want it, make what you want when you want to make it. There's a solution for everything and that's great and wonderful and we benefit from all of that. But it doesn't help me develop the virtue of patience required to flourish in the, the life that God created us to live within, right? Um, final thought here. I'm going to invite the band to come up. Final thought here. Um, the thing about seasons is they come and they go and they happen, and there is a degree of... Um, of power, like I can't enforce my will necessarily on my season the way Parker Palmer's talking about. But there, there is a way to work with the season that you're in. 
Uh, I, I like the idea of um, the Israelites wandering through the wilderness. And, you know, there was a shorter route available to them if they were willing to just follow God there. Um, the route doesn't get any shorter than that route, though. So this idea, but, but then there's a long route that they took, and that was the 40-year route. And so there's this idea that, like, you can't make your season, if you're in a season of frustration, you can't make it any shorter than it has to be, but I think you can probably make it longer. Does that make sense? You can probably extend it if you're, if you're relating to your life as if it's a battle you're fighting, and you find yourself fighting against the circumstances of your life, you can sometimes find yourself fighting against God. <laughs> or am I willing to embrace reality receive God's presence in my life and follow him and work with him. Learn the lessons that I'm here to learn and even take the steps necessary that he's leading me to. Sometimes discerning your season and what God's saying in it, sometimes it means simply waiting, just waiting, being in a season of waiting. Sometimes it means taking action though, getting on the dating site, going to see the fertility doctor, getting counseling, right? You with me? Sometimes there's a step that God will lead you to take that has to do with the resources that are actually available to you. And that's you working with him to move forward in your life and not staying stuck. And there are other times where you're going, I, we've, we've used all the resources. We've done everything we can. I'm going to be here. And so it's so important, the, the skill of discerning and relating. God, what are you saying? Can you honestly ask him, how are you, what are you leading me to do? How are you leading me to relate to my season right now? Can you honestly ask him and then honestly take steps, whether those steps are proactive or those steps are the active waiting that sometimes faith requires? No one can tell you which is right actually in the moment. Only you can decide as you walk with Jesus. But the skill, man, this learning that skill is, is the key to flourishing in a life defined by seasons from one to the next. The boundary lines are here now, but the inheritance is coming. And God all along has been our portion. Jesus, would you speak to us? Would you help us relate honestly to our lives and help, you, help us see you in it right now? And help us be people who learn the skill of walking with you in our real lives, being present, being here, and stepping forward, not trying to force it, learning how to take brave action, and learning how to sit still and trust. Teach us the dance, teach us your ways, reveal the joy your presence right here and forevermore. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.